Okay, well, thank you. Good morning to you. Um, since uh, English is not your first language, I will try and speak reasonably uh, slowly. Uh, apologies also a little bit because I've been rushing around Europe and I haven't quite got these slides in the way I would normally like to have them. Um, I'm very happy for people to ask questions and to challenge anything I say. I'm more than comfortable with that. And if there's something you want me to spend a little more time on, I can do that uh, also. Uh, and actually, although I put the title Ships That Sail on the, o the Oceans of the World, Aspects of Their Operation and Support Structures, uh, I'll cover some of that, but in the, uh, I was a little uh, pressure from the nice lady opposite to come up with a specific title. And I was trying to compress lots of different lectures into one, and I'm not sure I've totally succeeded. But uh, let's see where we, we go. Now, first of all, it's quite interesting because we've got to look at the environment in which we live and the environment in which shipping performs. And really, as you can see, the ocean did not exist uh, 130 million years ago when the continents that formed from the breakup of the ancestral supercontinent, Panagia, uh, they rifted apart by the process of uh, seafloor spreading. So we've ended up with a world that's been created, of course, by natural phenomena. And as an industry, uh, we have to sometimes recognize that. And I think one of the concerns today for me, as I look at the world in uh, 2011, is that people are very busy doing what they do, and they're not standing back and looking at the context of things. And, and therefore, I think that's quite important to, 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 to stress, just the environment we sit in and how we got to where we, we are. Now, I put this in first, just give you a bit of a scene. Um, I wanted to go to sea as a deck cadet, and in the German system, you had a similar system. You had cadets going to sea to be a navigating officer. Uh, but in these days, when I wanted to do that, uh, I wore spectacles, and uh, the regulations then, and it was still true in New Zealand, by the way, they had the same British system, uh, that uh, if you went on the bridge of a ship, you were not allowed to wear spectacles. This has changed today, ironically, uh, and I could have been at sea uh, had uh, that happened. Uh, however, I, one of my first voyages was in a ship called the Nest Louisiana, and she was a liquid sulfur carrier. And uh, my knowledge of liquid sulfur was pretty close to zero. So I set off at the tender age, I think it was 17, uh, to Rotterdam, to a place called the Botlek in the River Mass, which is still one of the world's largest uh, uh, ports, Rotterdam. And in these days, we didn't have gangways. I had to climb up a rope ladder up the side of this tanker. And at the top of the gangway was this great apparition covered in gold braid, you know, looking down at me and saying, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here because I was told to be here. Uh, so the captain was a very dour Scotsman, uh, but a very consummate seafarer. And of course, being a youngster at 17, he my mother had ensured I had more than enough luggage to last me a, probably a couple of months. So my cases had to be hauled up in a rope uh, at the side of the tanker. And uh, I, I was quite surprised then to be given the owner's suite, which is rather nice. Uh, but this ship was quite amazing. It's the only time in my life I've ever been seasick crossing the Bay of Biscay. And the master said to me, stop being sick, go and eat, have a drink, and you'll be fine. And indeed, to this day, that advice has been well taken and accepted. Now this engine room I'm in here on the left, top left, she was a Souser RND90, a big powerful diesel engine, unlike today. I mean the engine room and ships then were enormous. I mean it was from the, the deck plating right up to skylights. Now you've got small medium speed engines which are very compact uh, and different systems and to actually control the engines, you, there's a lever, I've got my hand on it there, I was actually controlling the engines, right? And it was very heavy. It was quite a wonderful experience. Anyway, um, we had started sailing out to Rotterdam in the bottom left there, and uh, that was crossing the Atlantic. And there's a winch, actually, forward of the, uh, on the port side, just at the bottom of the photograph. And in these days, they had things called work study. And some clever dickies came up with the idea that you could paint a winch in so many man hours. Uh, so the captain said, well, we've got a guy from the office here uh, as a supernumerary at one shilling a month. We'll test him in painting this winch. So I was sent out on deck with brushes and goodness knows what else and a tarry kind of paint. 
And of course, the work study people forgot that salt water has an influence in the maritime environment. So as soon as I was trying to wire brush this winch, of course, the sea spray came over and I had to start again. And I was meant to do this in six hours, and I was there 15 hours later. So naturally, the captain sent a letter back to the head office and said, your young man from Glasgow is not up to the job. Now, of course, in reality, he knew that the practice of being on the ship and in a maritime environment was very different. And therefore, to have any chance of performing any other way that I did it would have been impossible. Now, on the right, uh, self safety has moved a long way since then. But I had to wear overalls because that is sulfur. You can see it all over the deck. And they sent me under the tanks because the ship had 26,000 tons of liquid molten sulfur at 235 degrees Fahrenheit then. And underneath all these tanks were, mouse, were, were steam pipes. And you had to go and check there was no leakage of steam. And of course, uh, the steam pipes were all covered in asbestos in these days, when I think about it now, uh, which would be unheard of today. Anyway, I was sent under in all this gear, and hard hats and all this, to actually check there was no steam leakages. And then at night time, he sent me out the deck to do uh, various uh, samples of the sulfur fumes to make sure that the temperature was maintained. So, that was the first time I learned that in industry, if you don't work on the shop floor for a period of time, you won't really grasp a lot of the issues. And that was a wonderful introduction for me. Then I went to Hamburg and the Port Campbell. And as you can see, the bottom right, she was a cargo ship with derricks, which you, you get today, but not in the same ways we had then. And that lovely ship, the Port Campbell, that was the pilot in Hamburg. And the ship on the top right was a ship uh, called the Eden Bridge. She was a 150,000 ton oboe, oil, bulk, and ore carrier. And that's what they developed at that stage, oboes. They were, to some degree, successful, but not totally. So in one cargo, you would carry oil, and then you would clean the tanks, and you would carry grain. Now, it was a very clever system, like a garden sprinkler. It was a butter with pump under the hatch cover. And what you would do, if you're carrying crude oil, you would do a, 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 a crude oil wash. Actually, you would actually, in this sprinkler valve, they would actually use crude oil to break down the waxy residues. Then you would do a hot wash, and then you would do a cold wash, and then the crew went into the tanks and dug out the slush. Uh, and then it was given another hot wash, another cold wash, and then the ship was ready for grain. Now, actually, it really was quite successful. And I was sent there under that ship, so you be up the Baltic. I remember that vividly because. Uh, we were, I was on the radar, one radar, and the third mate was on another radar, and I saw a blip on the starboard bow. And I said, I wonder what that is. Well, I knew fine what it was. It was another ship. Uh, anyway, third mate, young man, a little bit nervous, and it was our job to maintain our course. And he panicked a little bit, and uh, he realized that the other ship wasn't going to alter course. So uh, he managed to get the autopilot off, went hard to starboard. Now, if you're in a ship of 150,000 tons and you go hard to starboard, a certain vibration is caused in the hull. And the captain, of course, was in the bridge in like 34 seconds. And by the time he got there, the other ship was on our port uh, beam and with no one on the bridge at all. Now, I say that to you because when we look at standards of maritime training, we've got to be very concerned. These big LNG carriers are valued at probably 400, 500 million just for the ship. And you add the value of the cargo, add a billion and a bit. And the people that are running these ships are looking after an asset and cargo, one and a half billion US dollars at any one time. So the knowledge you have to have and the experience and judgment you have to have to drive these things and deal with the unexpected is fundamentally terribly important. Now, the sea has many states and many faces, as you will uh, see. Um, uh, uh, I use these uh, slides on a lecture on a cruise ship. And in fact, uh, the slide on the top right is not untypical, I have to say. And I have been through a lot long ago a Force 12, often you find on banks, and it is quite an experience. Uh, now, we were on a ship that was actually built for the Atlantic. Because when you're designing ships, or when the naval architect is designing ships, these ships have got to be designed with the oceans that they're going to transit in mind. So, for example, some of the new cruise ships that are built today, designed for the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, are totally useless in the North Atlantic. 
Uh, uh, therefore, we were in a ship that was very fine and stable for that purpose with very fine lines. Um, so you've got to be able to deal with that kind of weather pattern and weather is emerging is a very big issue in the shipping industry. Now this is a Roro ferry, as you know, Roros are very important now because they are used for mostly intra-European continental journeys and they're carrying uh, trucks and cars and uh, various other uh, equipment. Quite a lot of containers on wheels are loaded on uh, Roros. This particular one is in the island of Shetland, which is the north of Scotland. And this ship goes through some of the worst seas around because if you look at the Pentland Firth that separates Orkney and Shetland from the Scottish mainland, that is one, it's important for two reasons. It's important for one because a lot of the ships from the US coming to Bremerhaven or Bremen or Hamburg or Wilhelmshaven will transit the Pentland Firth. And the weather with the tidal rips, it's running sometimes at eight to nine and 10 knots, is very, very dramatic. Anyway, these ships pile through, and I've got a photograph somewhere if we had time, of one of these ships literally at 45 degrees dealing with the weather. Now they are on a government contract, they must perform. And as a consequence, regardless of the weather, unless it's really extreme, they don't sail. But because governments tend to not uh, look at things commercially in the way that we would, they, they will increase speed of the behind schedule at enormous cost of fuel just to meet a time schedule because they're judged on their ability to be on time. And when you're dealing with fuel at $550, $600 a tonne, that becomes a big issue, all to maintain 24 knots. And that is another factor, fuel, we will take into account. Now there's loading Aurora. That's one of the Finlines vessels, and uh, you can see how the vessel is loaded. Now ship stability in Aurora is very, very important. It's very important in all ships, of course. Um, but there was some pretty, the herald of free enterprise, you're all too young to remember that in Zabruge, uh, many years ago, but the ship literally went, uh, three things happened in a very short space of time. One, the bow doors were closing, but not closed. Two, the ship uh, went, the, 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 the master increased speed at that particular moment, and a particular wave configuration uh, uh, actually met with the not totally closed bow door. And the Herald of Free Enterprise, of course, uh, collapsed. And you had the incident up here in the Baltic as well, uh, the Tallinn uh, ferry. And um, that, of course, led to various treaties because all of your maritime treaties are a result of a maritime accident. The Titanic, for example, uh, created the Solas uh, uh, program. And then you had Marpole, which was an oil spill, uh, created in Torrey Canyon off the coast of the southwest of the UK. Uh, and then we had the ISM code from the Herald of Free Enterprise. Um, now, if you get an inch of water on the deck, it's very serious uh, because that can capsize a vessel like that. So what now? You've got all sorts of watertight bulkheads, many more than you used to have in the olden times. Uh, and the safety standards, of course, are much, much higher now than they were uh, then. Finline, a very fine organization, of course, uh, with uh, ships all around the Baltic. There is uh, the route there, some of the, the routes that we take. Now, the ice is still a big problem this year in the Baltic. Um, it's not going to be clear probably till the middle of May. So access into St. Pete's is still an issue for container ships uh, particularly, and rollers, of course. Uh, uh, but that 